All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 52 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. 20 minutes with some of the world's top fitness professionals. I'm your host, Anthony Arendi. You can get the show notes at continuefit.com. Remember, that's where I keep all my podcasts as well as Shrink Coach TV. Make sure you go to iTunes. I know I say it all the time, but if you don't go to iTunes and subscribe and leave us a rating and a review, nobody can know about the show. So it helps us on iTunes and people helps for people to find the show. All right, for today's episode, I have on Dan John. Dan has spent his life with one foot in the world of lifting and throwing, the other in the foot of academia. He's one of the most sought after lectures in the fitness world. I've actually witnessed him speaking to standing room only crowds at the Perform Better Summits. He's an amazing athlete too. He's an all American discus thrower. He's competed in the highest levels of Olympic lifting, Highland Games, and the weight pentathlon, which he actually holds the American record. He's a prolific prolific writer. His books include Intervention, Never Let Go, Mass Made Simple, Easy Strength, Can You Go, Before You Go, Before We Go, and Now What? Dan, thanks for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I really enjoyed our last talk, and uh, I have to leave for Korea, so uh, we might not have a chance, <laughs> literally, ever to speak again, <laughs> but uh, let's. I, I didn't want to put this on hold because you hit the holidays, you hit this, and Pretty soon it's April and we're still talking about it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get right into it. What is your story? What was that early spark into a fitness lifestyle? Well, um, I used to think I used to say it was my aunt Florence, but actually it was another aunt of mine who died, and she left us a little bit of money, not very much at all. My aunt Florence left us uh, individual money later on. That's where I made the mistake. But we had a little chunk of money, and my brothers went to a, a very high-end uh, athletic store called Sears, Sears Roebuck, <laughs> and bought the Ted Williams barbell set. And it's funny because just a few months ago, uh, I found on eBay the original uh, Ted Williams workout plan that actually I fell in love with when I – so it was 1965, so I was eight years old, and it was that booklet and the weights, the fact that I could – I mean, my goal was to pick up that barbell with those two big 10 pounders on each side, you know, and uh, I don't know. I just, I, you know, the, the thing about weightlifting is it's progressive, progressive resistance exercise. And I think even at that age, I kind of got the, the notion that if you did a little bit every day for a long time, all kinds of good things would happen. Just like if you go to school every day and you do your homework and you, you know, you do all this and that good things happen over time. And I, and I like the idea of looking good and feeling good and being good at something. And wouldn't you know it, just a few years later, I, I bought my first real book on it, which I still quote, uh, Miles Calvin's book, Bodybuilding and Self-Defense. And then I read The Sword and the Stone and Seven Days of Sunday and all these other books that got me down this path to discus throwing and Olympic lifting and stuff. But it all started with a Sears Barbell set and the idea that if you did three sets of 10 or three sets of eight, all your dreams would come true. And the funny thing is in 2017, I'm not sure there's better advice, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's, yes. that's amazing. Dan. Yeah. So w the motivation at that, like, cause at eight years old, you know, you're probably not getting huge biceps, but that motivation was just completely like, I want to lift that up. Yeah, pretty much. Now, you know, I'm also the youngest of six, so, you know, my brothers almost instantly could, you know, put, you know, weight on there and pick it up. And I just found it interesting because even though I was um, uh, Rich is 12 years older than I am, Ray's uh, 11 years older, Gary's eight, and Phil is four years older than me, and I have a sister, Corrine, who's seven years older than me. Even then, I could see that my route to strength could be faster than theirs, just, just had to do this practice thing. And, and I know that kind of thing sounds crazy, but just that when you pick it up and you stop there and you strive, and then a few days later you get that weight, uh, it's just, that's magical. And the same way you learn how to do a pull-up, you know, you hang from the bar and then you jump up and you use your feet on the side, and, you know, pretty soon you're doing 14 pull-ups, you know. Yeah. I love it. I've always loved it. 
Dan, so was there, I know with, with the brothers, there's always, especially with the younger brothers, I forget, I think it was uh, Daniel Coyle's book was talking about a lot of the fastest guys in the NFL were either like the mm-hmm. third or fourth or fifth child. Did you yeah, feel like that bolt, yeah. constant like urge to beat your brothers? Oh, it, I can't tell you of a better thing. Uh, you know, being the youngest, and I'm not going to brag, but I'm pretty smart too. I watched my brothers and my sister grow up and do things. And I would say to myself, okay, don't do that. That's not, that doesn't work out. Like lying to your parents, I realized never had any value at all. Cause especially if you told them later on, you lied to them, it hurt their feelings. And moreover, most of the time they know. And so my mom and dad would say to me in high school, what'd you do last night? I'd say, uh, we sat in the Gregory twins, uh, front room. We watched, uh, old monster movies, sat around and talked about how pathetic our lives are. We did that for four hours. And by the time I'd be done with my parents would be like, Oh, get a life, son. Jeez. You know, here's some, here, here's some vodka, you know, here, <laughs> yeah. I, my, Cause when you're absolutely candid with your parents, most of the time it's pretty dull. So actually I, I lucked out with that. That'd be a good example, but also I'd watch them. Uh, they got into cross country in the middle distances and, and I realized that the way we were built, we should all have been throwers and football players. And so I did that. And it's interesting because my brother Gary in his, uh, adult years has become a very good hammer thrower, which is kind of funny. That's very cool. he was, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're constantly, I mean, um, when I was, when I was in the third grade, I was getting knocked around in the street football games by division one athletes and no one has ever hit me as hard as I've been hit on the street in our, in our, in our, uh, fly football, our football yeah. game. Very no cool. one's ever, I ran into a truck one time that was still moving. I tell you, once you've been hit by a truck, uh, and that little outside linebacker from Terra Nova doesn't really scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, Dan, when you were growing up, again, being a, the youngest child, um, was there at the time, were you looking up to all your brothers? Was there like a superhero out of everybody where your parents or who was that person that you were kind of looking up to that kind of shaped who you are? Well, in my family, it's pretty easy. I mean, we had the, we had the boys going over to Vietnam every so often. So, you know, you'd be, you know, this isn't a good thing or a bad thing, but every day my brothers went to Vietnam, my, my mother cried every single day. It's one of those things that's, you know, in hindsight, you're like, wow, what a terrible thing. But at the same time, there was a lot of community pride in the fact that my brothers went off to Nam. Now, that is my community. Now, outside of it, all my brothers were called baby killers and all the rest of those terrible things. And this newfound respect for the military is completely lost on me because I, I watched how people treated my brothers when they got back. So I struggle with uh, everybody's a hero now. I mean, these, you know, I got two brothers disabled from Vietnam and I mean, they got urine. I mean, you know, they were not treated well uh, when they got back. Yeah. So for me, when you have a brother off to Vietnam, for one thing, you live in a home. That's oddly tense all the time. Uh, everything, you're all, my mom lived in terrible fear of guys in uniform coming up to the front door. That was her biggest fear, to be a gold star family, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so for me, I had these opportunities. And, and at Christmas time, uh, the nuns at St. Veronica's would have the whole class write letters to my brothers. So. You know, it was like that. I thought that I always thought that was pretty cool that the school kind of adopted, uh, you know, our family's issues uh, and uh, you supported it. Yeah. Uh, whereas much of the rest of the United States, obviously, and I, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm guessing you're not 60. Uh, the 50. rest of the United States. Yeah. yeah OK. But even that okay, case, so you would have been on the. Yeah. You would have you'd been on the brink of it. You would have been aware yeah. But it was it was it was quite difficult. And uh, so, you know, we didn't have these commercials of the, you know, everyone getting up in the plane and saluting. We didn't have that. We had baby killers. So for me, I was oddly lucky that I had a community that thought my brother was here. My brothers were heroes. Yeah. And I was also in a community that thought if you played football for South City High, South San Francisco, that you were the king of the hill. So it was real easy for me to get. Uh, channeled into positive things yeah. with those terribly negative experiences. Yeah. 
Very cool. Well, Dan, what about now? I mean, you, you travel a lot. You're exposed uh-huh. to so many good people. You, you're you in different worlds. You're a teacher, you're a professor, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you're teaching in fitness. You're doing a lot of stuff. Anybody out there that you kind of look up to right now that you're saying they're doing some great things? I love what they're doing. Well, I, I just always have to throw in my coach, Dick Notmeyer, and I think I've mentioned him to you before. The reason I, I think so highly of Dick is that uh, he's 86 years old. Every time I talk to him on the phone, he tells me, make sure I eat my protein to do my front squats. Uh, last time I talked to him, he said uh, he, he has to choose now every day between either weightlifting or riding his bicycle. He can't do both every day. And he told me, you know, you got to keep an eye on that. And I was like, oh. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Dick out there as one. Now, I also picked a really good hero as a child named Kenny Avery. And this year, it's an interesting year. This is the 50th anniversary of a lot of interesting things. It's the 50th anniversary of the Carol Burnett Show. It's the 50th anniversary of 60 Minutes. But it's also the 50th anniversary of the Cincinnati Bengals football team. And they brought Kenny Avery back with his old room, roommate, Al Bocamp. Now, what's interesting about that, Kenny is white, Al was black, and they had them room together at a time where that's not what you did in the NFL. Uh, a black and a white rooming together. I mean, it was like unheard of. And so on the 50th thing, they talked about, you know, how courageous both of them were. And it made me happy because Kenny Avery has been my hero since 1970. Mm -hmm. So I got to just tell you, and not just because he was a good football player, because he also did the right things. And I think, you know, I always tell my daughters, make sure you're on the right side of history and things. Always make sure you're on the right side of history about things. Excellent. And it was kind of nice to have a hero who, who did that for yeah, me. Yeah, very cool. What about now, yeah. Dan? Your message, again, um, you're out there, you're writing a lot, and um, your message really resonates with the fitness world. Who are you trying to be a superhero to with that, with that message? Well, you know, I had some great mentors. I had some great coaches. I was able to read uh, good quality information at that really foundational time in my career. Those, those times where, um, I, I, I knew the importance of nutrition, uh, good protein sources. I knew the importance of full body movements, power lifts, Olympic lifts as a foundational thing before I got hit by all the noise and so what I'm trying to do with, with my career now is try to get people to not have so much noise. Uh, most of the noise for a long time came from the bodybuilders. Uh, I always talk about Ar- the, the change, the world-changing event, Arnold, the end of education of a bodybuilder. And all of a sudden, bodybuilding became the paradigm of this industry. And then it became fighter. I'm a fighter. You know, the guys working out, to, you know, I'm a, I'm a mix, a mixed martial artist. Yeah. And I'd say, you ever been punched? No. Well, then you're probably not a fighter, you know. Um, uh, and then, of course, you're always getting hit by, and there's nothing wrong with this, Zumba, Pilates, all these, all these uh, high-intensity aerobic workouts. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is be uh, – I'm trying to be a, a safety net for, for sound training. That, that's kind of where I'm, my, my mindset is. I'm heroically hanging on to – to the fundamentals. And as I told you last time, you know, J.K. Uh, Rowling's great quote, rock bottom was my foundation. Well, for me, I try to get people, is the fo- the foundational movements are the foundations. Uh, the best are the best at the basics, you know, that kind of thing, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dan, you know, with that being said, let's segue that into, you know, this idea about the safety net. What do you think that we are doing right? I mean, there are there's a lot of messages out there, but in in, in terms of the industry and where we're going, hmm. what do you feel like we're doing right, though? Well, we've rediscovered the lower body. And I sound, I tell that to people and I, it cracks me up because I'll be doing the thing. and Some will freak out because I don't mention lunges, which I just, I don't care. I do anything you want. I just don't, we don't. But uh, the point is in 2017, people are arguing with me about including lunges. 25 years ago, if I said lower body work, everyone would say leg curl, and leg extension. So we have come so far in training the whole body. Uh, in the last 25 years, it is remarkable, truly remarkable. 
how much more emphasis, you know, you got like Brett, the glute guy, and you've got, you know, you've got the, you know, the RKC, HKC with the kettlebell guys, you know, really emphasizing the, the, the butt in the squat and, and the swing and even the snatch. Uh, you got the Olympic lifters, uh, you know, uh, really getting into that, the power lifters. So, um, and again, many people listening to aren't going to hear this because they don't know, but we became very upper body in the field for way too long. And yeah, I mean, you still fight it with a teenage athlete doing curls and skull crushers, but that's even then that's almost, then we just make fun of, we call it the, you know, the guy curling in the squat rack. That's, yeah. that's just such a cliche. And the truth is I could care less if you curl in the squat rack at the gym because you're not going to, I don't train at your gym. So do whatever you want at your gym. <laughs> um, uh, the other, you know, a couple other areas, I think, uh, you know, I think we've I think we've gotten some good models of nutrition that we didn't necessarily have before. Uh, people are finally breaking away from. Uh, you know, I, I got respect for the government, but the USDA has been really struggling with uh, the food pyramid stuff and the, the the four basic food groups. And I think people are starting to realize that, you know, sugar. No matter what, I mean, it's obvious that the sugar industry covered up. That they're just as bad as some other. I mean, they, they might be one of the worst things you could put in your body. There was a cover up that's pretty obvious now, just like with smoking. Uh, people are starting to really go, well, sugar is bad for you. Whereas 30 years ago, you'd still argue that. You know, uh, as a child, I had Cheerios and a piece of white toast for breakfast every day, and I was starving within an hour. Yeah. And now we, now we know why. I was turning myself into a diabetic, you know. Um, so, I think we've come a long ways that way. Uh, I think we have the machine world and it's, is in an appropriate place now. Um, in the seventies, uh, you know, <laughs> what's that Arnold movie with the machine Terminator. Yeah. We had the term the Terminators, the, the machines were taking over universal and universal and Nautilus and all that. So I think we're in a very good place right yeah. now. Honestly, agreed. as bad as it is, we're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Good stuff. All right, now it's time for the Marigold Bars Stop and Give Me Five segment. Five rapid-fire questions and answers brought to you by Marigold Bars. Grass-fed protein, gluten-free, organic ingredients, non-GMO, no preservatives. You actually have to keep these things in the fridge. They're so good, and they taste amazing. No lie, these bars are really good. Check them out at MarigoldBars.com. All right, Dan, you ready for this? I, let me mentally prepare myself. Yes. <laughs> All right. A scotch with anyone from the past, who would it be? Uh, Benjamin Franklin. Nice. Uh, he, uh, you know, he was one of the first great generalists. He was, he is the foundation of all of his time management people. Uh, he, he uh, is one of the people who really looked at life and organized it. And I, I you know, he's involved with, with foreign, I mean, obviously, you know, he was a representative to France for a while. Obviously, had a big handprint in the Declaration of Independence, probably the Constitution too. Uh, his electricity studies. He was an inventor. You know, I mean, yeah. I just found I find him fascinating. Very yeah. cool, Dan. If you could be in a band, what band would it be? Okay, this one just shows sh Glenn Milk. Oh, nice! I love you know, it. In the mood, uh, I got a gal in Kalamazoo. <laughs> I can, you know, he had that terrible, tragic death in World War II. But uh, the thing is, if you go on YouTube, you just look at some Glenn Miller. Uh, there'd be the Sunrise, uh, Sun Valley Serenade. We have, they, they have him in there. And there is also the Glenn Miller story. But yes. uh, string of pearls in the mood. I just, I, love I it. just. They, they had no bombs, I tell you that. Yeah, yeah. I worked in a swing dancing music bar ah, in the 90s, okay. so I was a bartender. Oh. I very loved it. Uh, Dan, you're on a desert island, and perform better. Chris is going to fly in one person to lecture at the Desert Island Summit. Who is it? And I had a toss-up on this. One was Boyle, Mike Boyle, because Mike and I would be able to talk about a whole ton of things besides training. But then I decided I'm going to go with Mark Fisher, Mark Fisher Fitness, because every time I'm with Mark, we not only laugh, but I learn all kinds of things about stuff I didn't know. Yeah, I'm not that interested. I don't really care if it's five sets of two or five sets of three. I want to be with somebody that, uh, you know, really has uh, 
some gravitas in other places in life. Yeah, he's awesome. He's so interesting guy. Brilliant guy, too. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan, in the book, The One Thing, they ask, what's the one thing you can do such that by doing it, everything will be easier or unnecessary? So I'm going to ask you, what's the one thing that coaches and trainers can do such that by doing it, everything will be easier and better for their career? Yeah, it's one of my five pillars of coaching. Ready? Three words. Proactive, not reactive. If you're reacting as a coach or trainer, you're not very good. Uh, if you're reacting, it's apparent you've missed the boat too. Proactive. Uh, it, that's why I have so many checklists and menus and uh, all, all the nonsense I do with the shirts and the pants and the shoes. Uh, <laughs> I am, I am constantly thinking ahead of what's coming up. I refuse, uh, even as a, you know, uh, I, was, I was thinking about this. Can I go on just a few? Yeah, a little go, bit ahead, go ahead. Okay, you know, I'm, years ago, we were at uh, practice one day, and we were getting ready for a game, and I said, and okay, let's, okay, starting quarterback, hurt. What do we do? And I go back up, so we sat in the backup, and we ran three safe plays. Okay, backup quarterback, hurt. What do we do? And now, of course, we're now sitting in a sophomore or junior, you know, sophomore practice, the third string quarterback, and getting a snap is gonna be a miracle, okay? One of my assistant coaches said, well, that's, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't talk about the kids getting injured. I'm like, how many years have we gone through where we didn't lose our starting quarterback? And, we, and he goes, well, we lose them every year. Right, so why don't we practice losing the starting quarterback so in the game, it's, we flow with it. And by God, poor Pat, next game he gets hurt. Uh, uh, so when you're coaching, good coaches, you you, you, you set up things. You, you practice third down and 15. Everybody's a good coach on third down and one. Third down and 15 coaches, that's a little different. You practice taking a knee. You ta practice taking a safety. You practice bad punts. You practice bad kickoffs. So that when the game happens, your athletes aren't going, oh, what do we do? Yeah. It's they, so they true. Know, they yep. know what to do. Yeah. I have I have my athletes practice uh, with water in the discus ring. I have them practice with other implements. I even have them practice with uh, non-discus throwing shoes sometimes because if they ever forget their shoes, then they're ready to go. They're still ready to go. Yeah, love it. Good, good advice. Yeah. Uh, Dan, if you could be in any movie, what would it be? Return of the Jedi. All right, very nice. Well, and not only that one, I love Star Wars, but that third one I didn't like at all. Oh, yeah, the one with the look, uh, not the, the little, God, the little, uh, God, I'm getting called by everybody. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, I thought I thought that would have been the one. I, I like the idea of the, uh, uh, I just love that show. There you go. There you go. Uh, and then I kind of toss in another one that you might not know. The Four Musketeers, the one with Michael York and Raquel Welch and uh, oh, the, just about everybody in Hollywood who's ever been famous, uh, Richard Chamberlain and all the rest, just to be in that movie, just to be in the, you know, the lot between takes, you know, yeah. you know, sharing a sandwich, you know. I always think about that too, but be in the, in the lot or at the, the downtime, that's a, that's yeah. a cool part of it. Dan, uh, are you, what are you working on right now that's getting you really excited? Well. I don't know if this is going to be a book or just be a, a series of lectures, but my, my movement matrix, uh, the, you know, I keep cutting, I keep cutting my movement matrix down into more and more intelligent and reasonable, uh, things. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to try, I'm trying to have, so it's push, pull, hinge, squat, load, and carry. Okay. Okay. No big deal. It's isometric moves, slow moves, uh, what I call anti-rotation, and then we pick up speed, more ballistic movements, okay? And so that gives you this little chart, and I keep trying to, I keep going through and finding the best example I can find, one or two or three things. And my idea is no matter, either if you're working with somebody who's 95 or you work with an elite athlete, you can just go into that matrix and say they need this, 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 and this down, and then appropriate exercises to back it up. If you need work capacity, you go here. If you need hinge, you go there. So I, I, I really find this really interesting to me, okay? Yeah, sounds like it. Good, good stuff. Dan, last 30 seconds. Letter to your younger self, young Dan. What are you telling him? Well, I always were. I, I wrote an article about this one time. I wouldn't tell him very much. 
because I wouldn't want to ruin. The one thing I would tell him is getting out of the back of the ring and the discus, he needs to, to get off that left leg faster. And uh, always say yes when your assistant coach says, uh, uh, I'm getting set up with the girl. Will you be my wingman? <laughs> there you go. Very cool. Well, Dan, uh, we really appreciate you coming on. You're one of the best storytellers in the business. And uh, like I've told you before, uh, you're one of the more genuine uh, coaches out there. Amazing listener. And uh, your sense of humor really attracts all of us to uh, your lecture. So thanks for coming on and doing it. Hey, really appreciate honestly, it. anytime. You're, you're easy to work with. You're a real pro. And it makes it real easy on my end. Okay. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate that. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 52 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. Thanks again to Dan John. Make sure to check out all the links to all his stuff at continuefit.com. Thanks again to Marigold Bars, high-quality protein with all the premium ingredients, and they taste good. Check them out at marigoldbars.com. Don't forget, please subscribe to the show. Leave us a review and a rating. It really helps us out. My name's Anthony Renna. Thanks again for stopping by.